It's a couple's special day. It's what anniversaries are traced back to. It's the time when one man and one woman come together to say, I do, and become husband and wife. Of course, I'm talking about a wedding, wedding day. Do you remember yours? Well, here's a couple picture of ours, Casey and I, back in the day, 2004, a young Corey and Casey there, but we have great memories of that very day, and it holds a special day in our lives. But you know, weddings are like that. They're some of the most anticipated, the most, some of the most beautiful ceremonies and occasions that we can experience here in this life. And because that's so, there's some things that you do and some things you definitely don't do in the time that are leading up to that wedding. And first of all, you've got to have a plan. You've got to decide on the date. You've got to decide on the, on the place and the, get the photographer and the caterer and, and everybody all lined up. You better save some money. It's going to cost you some money. You want to look your best. Maybe you have a special workout routine or, or, or different eating habits. You get a special haircut or style. Those are some things that you do in anticipation of that special day. There's also some things that you don't do. Guys, don't schedule your annual guys trip away on that weekend. I'm telling you, that's not a good start to your marriage. You don't want to go there, okay? You also want, don't want to neglect having a budget, for that day because man it can get expensive so here's the point the anticipation of that glorious and great day that's coming in the future it impacts how you live before it happens and the same is true of the christian life chapel we anticipate something so much greater than a than than a wedding here on this earth we anticipate the glorious appearing of our lord jesus christ when he comes back here to return again to earth and he will return again this time not as a fragile baby as he came the the first time this time he's going to come back in power as the king of kings and the lord of lords And the certainty of Christ's return, it should bring great hope to us as followers of Christ. But that day should impact, it should influence how we live in the here and now. It should influence what we do and also what we do not do. That's our passage this morning. That's what we're going to be talking about. Take your Bible, your Bible app, whatever you have. Open up to 1 John chapter 2. If you're with us here in person, we have some Bibles and a a hardcover Bibles in the seats in front of you. You're welcome to use one of those if you like. In our series here in, in John's first letter, he emphasizes the essentials of the faith, specifically the essentials of truth and obedience and love. In last week's passage in chapter 2, verse 22 to 27, Pastor Luke did a great job of unpacking that for us, and, and, and that passage really focused on truth. How do you distinguish the true follower of Christ from the liar? And in the greater context that we find our passage this morning, chapter 2, verse 28, all the way to chapter 3, verse 10, it also focuses on truth. How do we distinguish the child of God from the child of the devil? That's how John puts it. But see, there's also an emphasis on obedience, as that too is a a key ingredient that reveals one's true identity. Today, though, in God's word in our passage, we're going to get a glimpse into the future which can and and should provide us hope, but also will give us a great challenge to live in a certain way today in light of that hopeful future. That's where we're going. Let's read God's word. Let me read it for us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 through 3, chapter 3, verse 3. Here's what God's word says. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. I want you to picture this scenario for me, uh, with me for a moment. Say you're in the car driving on the highway, you're on 94, you're going down the highway, maybe on a trip to Chicago. 
And maybe you're talking on the phone or you're, you're listening to music or you're trying to tune out the kids who are in the back and you're just, you're just driving along and you're like halfway along on the trip. And then all of a sudden as you're on the highway, you come to one of those spots that say for authorized personnel only, it's in the median, and you see one of these right there. Now what do you do? What do you feel during that time? What do you do? Well, the answer to that question is probably, are you speeding or not? Are you obeying the laws of the road? It all depends, right? It's because if you're, if you're smoking down the road at 85 miles an hour, you're, you're swerving all over the place, you don't have your seatbelt on, well, when you see that car, you're probably gonna slam on the brakes real quick, right? You're, you're gonna check your seatbelt. You're going you're gonna to get those sweaty palms. Right? You're gonna, the, the, all that stuff is going to happen. But if you've got the cruise control set to 70, you got your seatbelt on, you're not swerving all over, you're not sitting in the left-hand lane blocking everyone else from passing you, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You don't have to fear because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing on the road. And that's how John begins this very section of verse Chapter 2, verse 28. He's writing to Christians, telling them, telling us, we can confidently approach, not the police car on the highway, but we can approach our Lord Jesus when he returns to earth. And that's point number one in your outline if you're following there. Christians can be confident for then. The then meaning when Christ himself returns and he's going to lay out for us the how. How can we have that confidence? But first, I don't want you to miss the certainty that John says, the certainty of Jesus' is coming. It's easy to miss. We've got to read it carefully. Look at verse 28. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears. It doesn't say if. It's when. When he appears He's speaking of Jesus, that he will come back again. And this is emphasized all throughout the New Testament. And passages that speak of the parousia, that's the Greek word meaning for the coming of Christ. It's gonna come at that end of time when Jesus himself will come back to earth. And Jesus promised that he'd come back. And he always fulfills his promises. And this return will be magnificent. It'll be better than the grandest of weddings that could even happen on this very planet Earth. It will be personal. It's gonna be Jesus himself who will come back. He's not gonna send a representative in his place. It's Jesus himself in all of his glory and splendor, glorified, radiant body. It's gonna be public. Every eye will see him, it says. No one knows when exactly. We don't know the exact day or the hour, but it will be unexpected. It will be unwelcome by those who are not ready for it. Yet no one will wonder if it happened or if they missed it. No one is gonna escape that event. It's a future hope that should inspire hope for the true follower of Christ. In fact, John says here that we can have confidence for that day. When is that day? For the return of Christ. Look at verse 28. He tells us how. And now, dear children, continue in him so that, for the purpose of continue, why? So that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Here's how we can have confidence, church, as we continue in Christ in the here and now, in anticipation of that day. And John is returning here to the, where he left off the previous section in verse 27 where those words remain in him. That's how the NIV translates it. But in the Greek, it's the same exact word, same idea. Here, though, it's in the imperative mood, which is frequently a command. And that coupled with the, the present tense of the word, which has an ongoing or a continual quality, it, those two things together tell us this very thing. John is not offering a suggestion here. This is not a suggestion. He's giving a strong challenge. This is an exhortation for Christ followers to stay connected to Christ. Keep following him. That's what he's saying. And as Pastor Luke said last week, to, to abide or continue or to remain, all the same, uh, same wording there. To know, to do that, it means to, to know it well. It means to, to love it and to, to live it. 
In the context of the passage, it continuing in him means, as John said in verse 24, not straying from the sound teaching that these believers had been taught from the beginning. John stressed that. Not straying from the Holy Spirit who lives within them, who is teaching them and reminding them and confirming them what has been taught to them and to us. It's continuing to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And then backing that up with a life that's consistent with that claim. Consistent with what we say we believe, especially in loving others. And church, you and I know we will not live that out perfectly. We don't live that out perfectly. We even as genuine followers of Jesus, we still sin. But, but when we sin, we, we, as soon as we, we, we need to confess it, we need to turn from it. And then we know that we have an advocate, right, who's gone in our place, who has died for our sins, Jesus. That's, that's what we have. But our overall lifestyle, it ought to be consistent with our claim to know Christ. The road to standing confidently before Jesus when he returns, it runs straight through how we live today, straight through continuing, abiding, and remaining in him. As we do that, we'll be unashamed on that day. That's the way that John puts it here. He equates being confident before Christ on that day and being unashamed there in verse 28. But it would also go to say, on the other hand, given John's style of writing here, he's very black and white. He describes those who are true followers and those who are false followers. There's no in between. It's, it's one or the other. It would go to follow them that those who do not remain, those who do not continue in Christ, they should have no confidence in standing before Christ unashamed when he returns. Instead, just the expectation of being put to shame by Christ, facing his judgment and rejection. You see, their failure to continue with Christ, it's a demonstration that they were not truly saved, that they did not belong to him, just like the false believers John talked about in verse 19. They did not continue in the faith, and because they didn't continue in the faith, that showed that they never really belonged in the first place because they didn't, they didn't continue. Church, you and I may be tempted to make little compromises in our lives that don't match up with our profession, that don't match up with the very word of God. It's so easy to get caught up in the moment at times and we, and we do this or we say this or we, it's so easy to accommodate to the culture, to fit in with the crowd, those who are around us or to simply just feed our, uh, our fleshly desires which the Bible says wars against our, our very spirit who lives within us. So let me ask you, what are those areas for you? What are those areas what are those areas that, that you're tempted to compromise in? That's what we're looking at this morning. John is, is challenging us. He's exhorting us as his readers to, to keep trusting Christ, to keep following his word, to keep obeying his commands, not because it earns us a right standing with him. No, not at all. Only God's grace and through our faith brings us into that right standing with him. But our obedience or our continuing him, that's the evidence that we belong to him, that we're part of his family. And that should bring us great hope for the future, great hope for his, the time when Jesus returns, that we can stand unashamed before him when he does. Another way to have confidence for then when Christ returns is to do what is right now. Look at verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. One of the main things John addresses in this letter is false teaching and false teachers. How to identify them, how to, how to tell who's a real follower of Jesus versus who is fake. The phonies, they claimed one thing, but they lived a life, their lifestyle didn't match up. It was totally inconsistent. And so John stresses here the importance of doing Doing, doing not as a condition of genuine faith, not as something that leads to genuine faith, but doing as a demonstration or as a result of genuine faith. That's what he does here in verse 29. In fact, it's a subject that he returns to almost verbatim in just the next passage when he distinguishes between the children of God, this is who belong to Christ, to God, the children of God, and the children of the devil. Here, though, just like the previous verse, it's another way for one to have confidence before Christ when he returns. 
in opposition to the one who may claim one thing and do another, the one who does what is right, is what John says. Does what is right. In imitation of he who is righteous, that's Jesus. That one demonstrates that they're born of God, that they're part of his family, which in turn gives confidence for Christ's return. So once again, brother and sister in Christ, don't quit on Jesus. Don't quit on him. Don't depart from from his word for something newer or something more progressive that seems to be out there and that tickles our ears a little bit. Stay grounded in God's trustworthy word that we have. Don't turn away from him when times get tough. And times will get tough and are getting tougher. Also, don't grow weary of doing good. Don't grow weary of doing what it's right, even if it goes unnoticed, even if it brings ridicule to us for doing what's right. We do what's right. We continue in him. We imitate our Savior by doing what is right in his eyes. Then we can look forward to that day with hope. Then we can stand confident and unashamed before him as we're living like that today. We look forward to then, but we also need to understand who we are in Christ now, and that's where John turns next. That's point number two. Look at verses one to three. See, most scholars look at this next section as sort of a parenthesis or a timeout uh, that's different um, from his main argument from verse 28 and 29 until the next section there in verse 4. But it really has some parallels with where we've just finished in verse 29, where he's talked about those who do what's right are born of God. Now John's going to lay out, here's what it looks like to have God as your father. Here's what's true of you if God is your father and if you know him and if you're a son or daughter of him and that's what he lays out and here's the first thing he says it means that we are deeply loved we're deeply loved look at the language there in verse one see what great love the father has lavished on us I love that word it's a great word it simply means given and and what John's describing here is that God gives his love like he's giving a gift and what do we do with a gift We receive it. It's given to be received. And when we receive his love by faith, a family relationship is established. And we are then called what John says right here, what is true about us in verse chapter three, verse one, is that we are called children of God. Now for those of you that are at the Wild Game dinner last year, hopefully many of you were there. It's a great night. We had a speaker, his name was Brent Henderson. And Brent said a phrase on that night that has really stuck with me and that I've thought about and I've come back to uh, many times since, since we had that earlier this year. And here's the simple phrase that he said. Whatever names you, owns you. Whatever names you, owns you. Think about that a second. Whatever names you, owns you. You see, his point was, is whatever label or title that we have can have incredible power over us either for positive, for good, or negatively as well. You know, think about how amazing the human mind is to recall certain things. But it's amazing in the sense that we can recall a sentence, sometimes even a word that was spoken years ago, maybe decades ago. We still have it right here. We remember sometimes certain things, but we go sometimes as well from remembering to defining ourselves by those labels. Defining ourselves by the labels that we put on ourselves or by other people have spoken about us. Let me ask you, what's your label? What's your name? What's your label? Maybe it's failure. Maybe it's a liar. Maybe it's divorcee. Maybe it's not good enough. Unwanted. Cheater. Stupid, ugly, unlovable. Some of the labels that others bring toward us, that we bring to ourselves. On the other hand, there's other names, there's other labels, there's other titles that even come from good things that that can serve to puff us up with pride and get us to look down on other people to think, oh, they're not as good as us because of this or or that. Or they they get us to be more self-focused and self-dependent rather than God-dependent. What's your job title? For me, it's pastor. 
Pastor, what's your job title? Business executive, maybe? Top of the class in school. Maybe you cling to bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctorate degree. The authority of being a coach. The authority of being a mom or a dad or a captain of the team. Friends, the names, the labels, the, those things have great capacity to define us in unhealthy ways. Uh, some labels can either weigh us down in guilt and shame from our past or, or our feelings of unworthiness or on the other hand, inflating us to be self-focused and, and filled with prideful arrogance. But see, for the follower of Jesus Christ, neither of those things should name us. Neither of those things should be our identity. The only name that should define you, the only name which should own you is the one that's right here in verse one. Child of God. That's it, period, exclamation point. That's it, that's what should define us. No matter what you've done in the past, no matter what you've achieved, no matter what somebody has said about you, no matter what you feel about yourself, let this very name by which you are called, let this define you and own you. Because this is what's true. Child of God. If you're trusting in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, God has chosen you. Isn't that amazing? He's chosen you to be part of his family and God sees you as a son or a daughter of him. That's how we need to see ourselves. Friends, we need to hold on to this truth. We need to have verses like this memorized and not just in our minds but travel into our heart because when times get tough, it's easy to forget that. It's easy. It's easy to believe the lies of our enemies or our enemy, Satan, who wants to plant those lies and and just destroy us. It's easy in those times to think God isn't there. God doesn't care. God has left us. But you see, for the true follower of Christ, this is what defines us. This is what's true. This is what tells us what is true about us. This is what's true that tells us that God is our Father who will never leave us and never forsake us. And we've got to let that truth define us and own us as a follow, follower of him. To be a child of God now is to be deeply loved. To be a child of God now is to be deeply known by our heavenly Father. But it also means that we are not known by some others, namely the world. And that's where John goes next in the end of verse one. He says, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. In other words, when he talks about the world, he's talking about the unbelieving world. And so we should not expect, as followers of Christ, we should not expect the unbelieving world to to always understand us or approve of what we stand for. In fact, it was said of Jesus in John chapter one, get this, the gospel of John. Jesus was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He made the world, but the world, the unbelieving world doesn't get it, doesn't recognize him. Jesus himself said this to his disciples. He said, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. He goes on to say, the world persecuted me. They're gonna persecute you. So church, as the unbelieving world around us gets more and more spiritually dark. We know that from Scripture. That's gonna happen. We probably experienced that. We're seeing that in our world, in our life, and even where we live today. As that happens, those who are true light will shine brighter. So let me say this. We need to stand out. Stand out, church. Shine. Shine our light for Christ. Don't just blend in with the rest of the darkness around you. Stand upon his word. Be that light. Pray for and be bold to proclaim the gospel of Jesus which has transformed your life and my life that has the capacity to change anybody's life no matter how spiritually dark that they are. That's how we need to live. We don't need to live in fear. We don't need to live in fear as God's people. We, we know our future is certain, right? It's, it's sure, it will come. We also don't need to isolate ourselves in a corner and just, just hang out with those who are light. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to be out in the dark world. We're called to shine the light of Christ. We're called to do good, but then to share this message of, of the gospel with people. Otherwise, how will they know? How will the darkness come into the light? 
We need to let our light shine, not compromising on truth, but also being abundant to share this grace that we have received and that others need as well. To be a child of God, then, is, not to, is to be not known by the world. It also means, though, that we are deeply loved by the Father. And in verse 2, John reiterates that great love. Uh, and t- he uses that term friends. Do you see it there in verse 2? It says, dear friends. In the original language, it simply means loved ones or, or beloved. He's very purposeful in that. He also reiterates the believer's identity. We are children of God right now. Not just when we die and go to be with the Lord. That's true of us right now. We have a special status as being part of his family. But it also means that we're not a finished product. In fact, the best is yet to come. We could say it in that way. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I'm going to share with you about my favorite dessert. In fact, my favorite dessert in the world is made right here in Stevensville, Michigan at Bit of Swiss Bakery. All right, you ready for it? Here's a picture of it. See if you can guess it. Maybe you've had it before. Anybody know it? What the name of that one is? It's called Chocolate Raspberry Rhapsody. How could that not be the best dessert in the world with a name like that, right? It's incredible. And let me describe to you, in every bite of that is incredible. The outside of it has got this raspberry layer. It's really thin. It's really light. It's got this crunchy chocolate crust to it. And then as you get in the inside, there's this chocolate mousse that's just amazing. It's awesome in every single bite. I'd love to see if I could describe it to you. But it is. It's just that amazing. But you know what? That's not the best part. The best part of it is right at the end. It comes in the middle. Check it out. You see that middle part? There's this raspberry part. I had to buy one of these this week just for sermon prep so I could be ready (laughs) to accurately describe to you and be able to tell you how great this is. So I was happy to do that. You know, sacrifice. You got to do it once in a while. But that's the thing. As amazing as that bite is on the outside, it's, it's what's at the end, what's the best. And that's the same thing in the Christian life. We are children of God right now. We, we, we look pretty good on the outside, in a sense, as, as, as followers of Christ. We have eternal life right now. It started the very moment that you said yes to Christ. That is true of us now. We are forgiven. We are loved right now. But all of that being said, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. We await the return of Christ when the blessings and the benefits of belonging to him, then, in the future, it will be fully and finally realized. Isn't that amazing? John says we shall be like him. We shall be like him. We will see him as he is. It's hard to even fathom that. And John doesn't go into detail even about what he means by that, but certainly it means that we'll be morally pure. We'll be without sin in any sense of it. Not even a, not even a hint of it will be gone. We'll have a glorified body that's not subject to sin and death and sickness and illness and disease or pain that'll all be gone. The best is yet to come, my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what lies ahead for us for the future. And because that's our future, that's got to impact how we live today. That cannot be our future. And then we just go off in a different direction, just do our own thing and, and, and just throw this out and don't. No, it's got to go together, right? Look at verse 3. John says, all who have this hope in him, this hope in Christ, the, this hope of being like that one day, all who have that hope purify themselves just as he is pure. Friends, we have this sure hope that Jesus will come again. He's going to make all things right. He's going to take all of those those who belong to him and we're going to be with him forever, experiencing his blessing and the joy of being in his presence. We'll be like him. Fully and finally a finished product spiritually in his presence forever. And that future hope should result in a present response for us. He says, John says, we're to purify ourselves. It simply means be holy, live a holy life. That's not legalism, but that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be. We're called to imitate the the, the character of our Savior. And John says it right here in verse 3, just as he is pure, just as Jesus is pure, you be like that. You, follower of Christ, be like that in your life, in your conduct. And that brings me to the main idea of our whole passage. 
If you forget everything else this morning, I don't want you to forget this one statement because I think this, is, this passage is what John is trying to communicate to us. This is our takeaway for today. Here it is right here. Christian, imitate Jesus now in light of the glorious future that awaits. Imitate Jesus now in light of the glorious future that awaits. Uh, we, we do what's right. Why? Because he's righteous. Be like him. We purify ourselves now. Why? Just as he is pure. Be like him. You are loved now because you belong to him. Love others. Imitate him. Imitate his character. Be like him. As we close our time this morning, I want you to take some time to think. I want you to take some time to pray about what your present life looks like. Let's do that now. Bow your head with your heads bowed. You pray. You talk to God. What are those areas of your life that don't very much look like an imitation of our Savior, of our Lord, of the one that we claim to believe in? What are those areas for you? Talk to God about that. Ask him, if you're not sure, ask him, Lord, is there any areas for me that that aren't matching up? Where are you dabbling with sin? Where have you compromised already? Where do you feel tempted to compromise? Maybe you've already taken a step down a path that you know is not good, it's destructive. Ask the Lord for help. Help me not to take the next step. What do you need to confess? What do you need to turn from? What do you need to talk to a fellow fellow brother or sister in Christ and ask for their help to encourage you, to hold you accountable? Would you have confidence to stand before the Lord if he returns soon? Why or why not? You talk to the Lord about those things. this morning or you're watching online and you haven't placed your faith in Christ yet if that's you your only action step your action step is not to go out and try to do a bunch of things or clean yourself up first your only action step this morning is to surrender yourself to Christ to trust in him fully as your Lord and your Savior trust him to forgive you and he will If you're ready for that this morning, you can say a prayer just like this silently right where you're at. God knows your heart, but these words aren't magic words, but this is just a way to express what's in your heart, what you want. If this is your desire, you can just talk to him right now. You can say, Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. And my sin separates me from you. I deserve your punishment for my sin. But today I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he died for all of my sins. I believe he rose again from the dead. And today I'm turning from my sin. I'm turning from any power that I would try to have in and of myself to earn it. And I'm simply surrendering to you, trusting in you that you did it all. Man, if that's your prayer, please come talk to me afterwards. If you're watching online, please contact me. I'd love to talk with you. Or maybe you're here and you have questions about this. I want to say to you this morning, you're welcome here. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're watching online. We'd love to help you and talk with you to help you to take that next step toward Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word, how it is challenging to us, and it's hopeful at the same time. Lord, help us to keep our, 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 our minds and our hearts fixed on the next life, fixed on the future, the reality that you are coming back, Lord. And in that reality, may it impact how we live today. May it impact the things that we do and the things that we choose not to do. May it impact how we, how we speak and how we don't speak. Help us to continue in you, abide in you, Lord Jesus. Remain in you no matter how hard that may come in this world. 
Thank you for your Holy Spirit who resides within every single one of us who truly have trusted in you, Lord Jesus, and you give us strength and power that's not of our own to walk with you, to live for you. And we pray that you'll help us to do that this week. We love you and we thank you for this fellowship. We thank you for your word. Continue to make us more like you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.